That's welcome right. to all of you for the observers of the Sunday. We are a small group today, but, yes. uh, <laughs> but uh, a fine group, I, I think. Um, I'm very happy um, that you've all come. Uh, when uh, Emmanuel Brunija, he was here last year uh, giving a talk on Brexit, we actually had a very interesting discussion on, on the question of, of Ireland, and, and we agreed that the next time he comes today, he would um, speak on the question of, of borders. And it happens that, uh, that at the same time, I'm very glad that uh, not only Emmanuel is back, but we also have another expert on, on borders, uh, which is uh, it's uh, David Newman, who is a professor at the uh, University, um, uh, Ben Gurion University of the Negev in Israel. And uh, uh, we also have here on the dais my colleague, co colleague Rita Bhattacharya, who has been working for a very long time actually on, on the, the, the questions of, of India's uh, eastern and northeastern borders. So we will have. Um, three different examples of uh, what is going on at the moment uh, in this time where it seems that uh, that we are experiencing a rebordering of of the world and um, I'm sure that uh, uh, we will have a very interesting discussion because I, I think all of you are doing uh, uh, doing very serious research in, uh, on this topic and we will all learn a lot, I think, from, from your presentations here, especially, uh, especially me, who is not an expert on, on borders at all. So um, I think we agreed that, uh, that David would start. And uh, I think I'll all have you decide otherwise. Okay, I'm going to start. You're going to start. Okay, so Emmanuel will start uh, with the uh, question of Ireland and the costs of, of uh, Brexit uh, with regard to the rebordering there. And uh, I'll uh, give out to the other one. Thank you very much. So we're a small group. It's my honor to be here. I'm really delighted to be here. I Last time that I gave a talk in, in September on Brexit, it was a debate actually uh, with the public officer of the High Commission. And it was very interesting and I've done a bit more research. So today I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Ireland, Northern Ireland. Um, and then I will discuss customs because it's a big bulk of the changes for the UK. And um, as I'm digging in, I haven't started the, the portfolio on migration and stuff like this, but I'm really interested in costing out basically um, the Brexit. And the part that I'm the most interested in is obviously the implementation of, you know, basically the UK borders because it has a cost, which um, is starting to appear as a policy concern by a number of organizations in the UK. The UK Parliament has done a report on this. You've got you know, a number of organizations that have looked into it. You've got the European Commission that has a number of reports also on this, and then a bunch of, uh, obviously, public affairs groups uh, that are interested in this. So uh, the talk is basically made of two separate sections that will probably last about seven, six to eight minutes each. Um, and I start with uh, Ireland because obviously it's very much in the media. I think the backdrop issue is an interesting one. And I, I, I'm sure that lots of people don't really size out what it means um, to have this backdrop issue addressed and why it's such contentious, right? It's extremely contentious because it's a complicated one, but also because the the two parties can't see eye to eye. The EU is defending Ireland, obviously, and the EU is defending peace. And the UK wants to defend the integrity of a political agenda, which is something very difficult also to, to, to see. So. so one of the things that I, I've always, uh, and that's work that we've done uh, with Katie Award at Queen's uh, Be uh, Belfast, um, and as you can see, my slides are marked as borders in globalization because it's my research program. It's a large research program uh, which has uh, a history of six years of research now. And when the Brexit um, discussion started, I had told uh, at the time Katie Award that I really wanted us to go and study basically what um, 
what was going to happen and look at some policy options. So we, we through the research program, we um, actually changed the agenda. The agenda originally was to look at the disappearance of the border and especially look at how you know, the UK policies contributing, contributed to the peace process and then suddenly we swapped to see what people thought about the possible Brexit options and so on and so forth. So we had a bunch of um, graduate student papers done on this and you know, MAs and reports and so on and so forth. So all the data that is here has been published one way or the other by uh, Katie and has been also used in some of the op-eds that she's published both in um, a number of, uh, not both, but both in, in uh, Northern Ireland, but also in, uh, across, for instance, The Guardian, where she has a series of papers there. One of the things that I thought was really fascinating was to realize this, uh, what the slides talks about here, is that UK funding um, is not as prominent as EU funding when we're discussing the Northern Irish economy. And most of the funding that comes through the agricultural policy really sustains agriculture in Northern Ireland. So it's very important to, to become aware of this because it means that, it means two things. It means that nor Northern Irish farmers will, will, will lose their market if there is a border, that is a hard border, if there is no agreement, if there is a hard border. They also lose access to subsidies. In, in, in the slide, you have the exact number, 87 pence per pound traded south, which is, which means that all of the goods that are produced in Northern Ireland go to the Republic Ireland so that they can go into the EU. And that number, I'm just insisting on it, but that number really shocked me because I mean, it means that agriculture will basically disappear and that there'll be a huge crisis um, if the uh, backdrop is not implemented uh, with uh, diplomat diplomacy, and with time necessary to adapt all of this. And that putting a, 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 a time limit on it is something that is um, uh, maybe necessary, but also very difficult to estimate, right? Um, Another thing that I discovered, which I think is quite interesting also, is that um, Northern Ireland by GDP is actually poorer, much poorer than the rest of the UK and certainly than Republic of Ireland. And, uh, and that's so the funds that are coming from the EU, so if we're talking about the peace funds, for instance, and PEC, uh, PEAC funds, or the Interreg fund, which are regional funds that sustain, for instance, regional hospitals that are on the boundary line, but so, so they've created EU-funded hospital regions that straddle the old boundary line. So you can see this, you know, how do you implement such a regional region, hospital uh, region? is because you network the family offices, the G GP, the general practitioners, and you have extremely efficient ambulance services across uh, the whole networks and all the way towards the hospital. And I did personal interviews with people on that very topic because there are three or four such hospitals today um, in, in Europe. And two years ago, just after re the referendum, the director of the re hospital region was saying to me that he's starting having difficulties to hire staff because people were not believing in the future of the hospital region. So that's kind of an issue. Um, so these are some of the things that I, I'm starting to talk with uh, about Northern Ireland because it basically you know, tells us a little bit where we are. Here you have uh, some of the numbers that I picked up from the European Union on these different issues and you can basically see quite well that um, you know, the, the cap, the, the um, Oh yes, the screen won't let me see it. So you can see that the cap pillar one, that's agricultural policy is quite significant, right? It's two billion uh, per uh, program generally. So it's it's a very significant funding help that, that agricultural uh, industry get. But you also have the rural development program, the cap pillar two, which is basically the transformation of agriculture into something much more uh, sustainable and very often it's been linked to you know activities of tourism and regeneration of historical sites and so on and so forth where 
uh, you want power basically uh, your communities and so on and so forth and you, you can see all the other funds and I talked about the peace and interact program as well as real vector to straddle the boundary line, right? Or help the communities to work together and have agreements that have to do obviously with very basic infrastructures like road, but also things like hospital, which is very sophisticated. But it can also be public transportation system, like you know, a network of buses and things like this. So you you create networks that overlap across the, the border region and then suddenly. Now, what is interesting in this is that, you know, it was starting to plateau. And that people were saying peace has in a way been established successfully in the region. Two years ago, this is what I heard. And that everybody obviously now is worried that all of these efforts could be questioned if we reimpose the boundary line. At least local communities and so on and so forth. So it's quite uh, dramatic when you see this. So if you have a hard border, um, there are a number of issues here. And um, maybe the, the best way to explain this would be to say that the whole issue of the backdrop has been a discussion between two very different kinds of bordering policies. You have the bordering of trade, right? You have the bordering of networks of trade and trade flows, which is one issue. And then you have the bordering of mobility, human mobility. And there are a number of factors that are quite interesting, but obviously Northern Ireland trades a lot with the Republic of Ireland today. But also when we look at who has right in Northern Ireland, you probably know this, but every single person from Northern Ireland can ask for an Irish passport. And today it's about just over 80% of the population that has actually exercised this right. So it, it's not that it's going to simplify a situation where you suddenly want to re-demarcate and impose the boundary line, right? because it means these people have more than one right. They don't have the territoriality, as we, you know, it's a bit conceptual, but the idea that they are locked into the territory of Northern Ireland or the UK versus the Republic of Ireland is actually made more complex because a lot of these people have these rights. And so some of the solutions that have been um, discussed, basically, um, and the idea of the backdrop is really about providing enough time so that the flexibility needed be implemented fully before you actually um, lock the borders in. So you would have, in a way, porous mechanisms until you know that the technology works. And you probably read in the paper that some of the pro-Brexiters were really hard-nosed, saying that absolutely no negotiation, and it was going to be uh, you know, a border, and that we had the technology, so why worry about it? And Barnier, who's the chief negotiator, would say, no, we we cannot rely just on the technology. The technology sometimes takes time to be implemented, and the disruption will be too great, and the violence could come back, and so on and so forth. So these are some of the issues here uh, that are being discussed, and that allow us, in a way, to understand both, both sides, but also the complexity here. It's not a simple situation that can just be implemented simply. So there are a number of scenarios, and you know I'm discussing them here very briefly, but there are a number of scenarios that allow for different options. And I'm going to come back to my slide after, but if you look at this map, and that's why I put the map here, one of the things everybody should understand is this, is that the EU has offered to give, in a way, citizenship rights to the whole island. That means, obviously, the Republic of Ireland citizens have full rights. They are EU citizens. But Northern Ireland people would also have rights. So that's one regulatory system that covers the whole island. And at the same time, we have the issue of trade. So 
we would have a circle that circles the island, and then we would have another circle that comes from the UK that overlap in the grey part, which is Northern Ireland itself. And that's for the mobility agreement. In other words, you want to discuss something that is as complex as this because you have two regulatory systems that will join and articulate in Northern Ireland. And that is one of the problems. The other one is that with regard to trade flows, the EU is suggesting that actually customs would include the rest of the UK for a certain period. In other words, you are not leaving the, the EU as long as you haven't resolved the border issues. Because you have two overlapping regulatory regimes that articulate this difficulty for a number of years. And obviously the Brexit just says, okay, we are okay with the backdrop, but you give us a final date. And the EU says, well, the final date will, will be when you have the capacity to implement actually the filtering. Now I want to explain to you, and I'm not gonna to go towards the immigration portfolio because I haven't done the research, but also because I thought looking at the custom issue was also more interesting and it's more salient because the EU is really a trading block originally, right? It's a security block first with, you know, you, you know coal and steel agreements um, for communities, but our atom communities, but also it's basically a free trade zone. And so you're going to see that if we only discuss the re-implementation, and I insist on the re, if we only discuss the idea that you are, have a member states like the EU implementing custom fully on, on its own, there are a number of issues here. So one of the things that I want to start with on this, and it's just to highlight the difficulty in Northern Ireland where everything is crystallized, right? But now we're talking about the whole of the UK having to re-implement, in a way, all of the standard, if you want, standard custom policies that any one state not member of the EU would have as a standard policy because they want control, you know, basically in and out trade, right? So the first one is this, is that the UK Service Service is the smallest in size that it's ever been since the Second World. So staffing has gone down for 65 years. Why? Because of economies of scale. And I'm going to illustrate this a little bit. And I'm only giving you, you know, some of the, like the, the appetizer here, like you get some of the figures here just because I want to tick, tickle suddenly some policy makers, you have a sense of these things and you probably are thinking it's, the number of custom declarations that have to be processed will is about 55, um, sorry, the number of custom declarations is about 255 per year. And I have a problem with my number. Yes, this is it. 255 million per year. And the issue today is this. The UK has the capacity in-house for 55 million. Now, I don't know if there are custom officers here that know exactly how it works, but the UK strategy right now is basically to use new technologies to deal with this. So the idea is to say, we are basically going to use IT and create you know, a standard platform and have all our operators implement this so we can bypass a very large number of traditional operators that are either in government or outside of government, right? They can be certified private sector ones, like freight operators in many countries, in Canada, in the US, this is the way it's done. But the point is, we, they have to find a way that they can actually process 255 million when they only have the capacity to, today to implement 55. So that's a bureaucratic, like technocratic kind of way of looking at this. It means staffing, and it means um, you know bureau um, having office spaces and the technology and so on and so forth. And the estimates today is that they need between three and five thousand custom officers. Now, in my own country, in Canada, we don't even train ten percent of that per year. We don't train five hundred custom officers per year. We don't have the capacity, so I don't know how they'll do it. 
Another thing is this figure, which you might find completely crazy, 19 to 26 billion pounds, which is the cost of transforming harbors, airports, seaports, warehouses, um, and all of the points of entry for custom purposes around and on the island. Why? Because right now the economies of scales have all been to the benefit of the member states, and they actually are located in a very specific country, which is the Netherlands, and to a certain extent as well Belgium, where you have very large harbors, as you probably know. Um, and so this is a big issue because it means that all of these functions of the border, of custom borders, actually not fully operational in the UK itself today. So to show you the complexity, I start with that chart, which is, um, uh, I'll give you some of the reference later, but it's to show you that custom is not completely, and I just want you to kind of remember these uh, three, if you want, pink boxes. Custom is not completely an in-house kind of function. Custom is implemented in the UK through a number of partners that involve a lot of private sector organizations. And so it's a public-private partnership with a number of certifications and standards that have to be implemented. And what we are looking at here is basically not only an in-house reorganization, transformation of functions in government, but also across all of those partnerships. And the least I can say here is that I think this takes some time. For any government, it would take some time. These are all the officers. If you want, I'll just pull them off. But these are all the officers with the different functions. And I'll actually dis discuss a, a little bit the full standard agency, which is the bottom one. Um, afterwards, I have a slide for it. But it's to show you that within government, there are many ministries that are involved. So you get a sense that you know even within government, it's really about governance. It's really about coordination of different governments across the board. And it's a very fairly large number of functions. And I'm going to illustrate this now by just um, giving you a few numbers. So overall, in the UK, we're talking about 100 government agencies and organizations that are involved. And that is, you know, counting the ministry plus within the ministry itself, the different offices of the ministry, so all the different directorates and subdirectorates and so on and so forth. But we basically have a huge governance uh, conundrum here that has to be. Uh, and so, you know, looking at, for instance, uh, some of the details, you realize that, as I illustrated earlier, right, as I illustrated here, you see that. It's across many ministries, it's across many functions within the different ministries, and it's pretty complex to obviously change and staff all of these ministers. But also, um, today we have um, this issue of the custom sleeps, and we have 180,000 traders that are involved with the small and medium-sized businesses. So, you know, in the ideal situation, all of them would basically have uh, the right standards in IT and they would be able to process everything inside and every time they ship things out or bring things in, uh, they can have all their documents done in-house. But we know small and medium-sized businesses struggle with this all over the world and these standards are well implemented in large firms, but for the small ones, we can look at the number of 180,000 traders and we can say, well, the top 20% are probably well equipped and any IT reform will obviously be successful with them fairly quickly, but then what do we do with others? And the overall cost um, estimates right now is an additional cost to trade of 4 billion a year. Now, the reason I put this there is that it's going to cost these 180,000 traders, 4 billion more. The UK has gone into Brexit because of additional payments of about that amount, at least declared and debated. 
So they will have to pay that anyway. And then when we look at you know, some of the government transformation, I take the example of the animal plant health agencies because you know, it's a fairly large one. It has, uh, and here you have the numbers and you realize that even if you just take one agency, so I'll go back just to remind you, the one agency is this one, it's standard, local authorities, port of entries, and you know, traders and so on and so forth, you realize that even there you have a fairly, number, a fairly large number of partners that are involved. And now you get a sense that you know, um, it's going to be post-Brexit, it's going to be pretty complicated to implement this, even just across one agency because of the size. Um, so the estimates for the UK Institute for Government, I know it's been deemed uh, that all the data they have produced was against Brexit, but I think they actually are very serious. They have a long history of study of UK government and policies and recommendations, so I think it's quite interesting to look at their work. And they say and write that it is the biggest challenge facing government post-Brexit. So I was kind of happy when I saw that quote, obviously that citation, because it kind of confirmed my own intuition that implementing new borders for the UK was going to be a big challenge because in the past it was an economy of scale for the UK that other states are discovering today because you know any other states member of the European Union is looking at this and they are now realizing how much they have been saving over the years and never really acknowledged and you can be Hungary or you can be Italy or you can be France or you can be Germany and you can say well let's do the study so we know exactly how much we're saving by working together um, and then I wanted to find exactly so I you know the estimates that I gave you 28 billion pounds per year but I couldn't find any detail uh, documents on the cost of new warehouses, new harbors. And then I found these um, examples for the port of Dunkirk and Calais, which, by the way, I think I have a map here. No wonder these are points of entry into the UK, right? You have, you have here Calais, and Dunkirk is actually here, and you have Dover here. And so you get a sense that if we have the right estimates on the other side, we would have some estimates for the, for the inside, and we get a sense of how much all of this is going to cost. So when we look at this, well, Dunkirk is implementing a plan, and Calais is also implementing a plan, that is pre-Brexit. So these estimates in the growth, in the expansion of the warehouses, the harbor capacity, the custom capacity, the, are pre-Brexit. So one thing that we discover with these new plans, if you want, is that Brexit is going to cost a lot of money to the trading partners with the UK, and certainly that is going to cost the UK even more resources. Um, and then in the case of Dover, there is a real issue because if you know Dover, which you know, I kind of like to read it in the reports, but I did visit Dover years ago, so I do know how it works. You've got that huge cliff on the city and the harbor is like squashed in between. And it's not, an, 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 it's not you know, uh, it's actually quite common to see lines of trucks going inside the city and then the trucks are regulated, they cannot come in the city but before and then the whole debate then is how do you organize the arrival of the trucks from the UK across the channel but by regulating basically their rights to be on the highway well before being into Dover itself and to find space where you can basically have warehouses and you know, all, the, all of the border functions along the highway, both but primarily for entry into the UK because you cannot stop, you cannot basically say in Dover like they did in Calais, we're going to create 
a 3,000 square meter warehouse because we need another one. They just don't have the space, right? Unless they go at sea. And the cliff obviously tells us that it would cost a fortune to do so. Um, and the numbers are quite high. I mean, just, you know, these, these numbers are plans that started before um, the Brexit uh, referendum. And we are 1.5 billion just on or euros on the, on the French side. So I think that when we look at this plus all of the other issues that I've discussed, the 4 billion a year and so on and so forth, we're probably actually, we probably are going towards estimates that are lower uh, than 23 billion in the end to re-implement custom. And again, it's not, we're not discussing immigration capacity here, just custom issues. So this is what I was saying a little earlier. There are other, there are other issues. The good news for us, obviously, is the little bubble here. Right, Belfast is actually a fairly small area, and then it's kind of interesting because it means that probably in terms of number, even without high technology, as uh, some elected officials have argued, it's something that can be controlled, but it's much more complex for Dover and the Channel Tunnel. So there you go. I think that custom is undoubtedly the biggest challenge uh, faced for the UK. And I think it's going to be very interesting to work on this a bit more. Add, obviously, the immigration portfolio and publish some nice paper on this, um, trying to assess. Because it's a lesson for other states. That's really what I'm after. Uh, comparing and then you know obviously the EU has never really done thorough surveys on this but they are now there is there are so many white papers and analysis that we actually have to start discussing them. Thank you very much. Yeah thank you very much uh, Emmanuel I'll, I'll hand it over without Yeah, okay, thank you. No, I was guilty when I came here of changing over my bag, so the notes I had left in another bag, but I have a PowerPoint, and which I'm not going to use some of the pictures on it. Yeah. Um, and uh, if any of you are interested, you don't have to take pictures, you're very welcome to send me your email, I can send you the PowerPoint, there's nothing private or secret about it, and I'm leaving it on the desktop here for anyone who wants to. So first of all, thank you for having me here, Brita. Um, um, I'm actually here in India for quite a lengthy period, for four months as a visiting professor at the SAU, teaching a course on geopolitics and borders to um, research students from all the seven countries of South Asia, which I find as, in, as, as interesting as they may find in engaging um, an Israeli professor with his London accent um, who can talk about both Europe and Israel. I'm just as interested about engaging them and what's going on in this region. You can imagine that last week I was getting lots of emails from back home about what's going on in India, Pakistan. We thought you were going for a peaceful four months away from, from all the hot areas. Um, I find it very uh, a bit of deja vu following Emmanuel because um, uh, rightly or wrongly, I've become one of Israel's experts on what happens in Britain. And I spend a lot of my time back in Britain. And tonight at 1 o'clock in the morning, 10 o'clock Israel time, I'm going to have my monthly interview on what's going on in Brexit and Britain and, uh, and, and other issues. But now I can turn to uh, what I do a lot of my work on, on geopolitics and Israel-Palestine boundaries. Um, I don't know whether you thought how interesting it was that the three countries all begin with the I. India, Ireland, and Israel. What is it about countries with I that have big border issues? Maybe that's just uh, co co coincidental. Um, and, but I think what's very interesting and what's very common to, although all of us obviously are going to have very different takes on border-related issues here this afternoon, I think what's very interesting is that it does say something about the fact that... Um, Borders are very much there, out there on the table. As Manuel said, different bordering processes are relevant even within one border. Because if you're talking about security, and if you're talking about economics and customs, and if you're talking about citizenship and identity, um, even within one context, you're not always talking about the same border. 
Uh, the location of the border is not necessarily the thing we're talking a great deal about today, although in these three cases maybe yes, and it says something about the sort of work that people like Emmanuel and I have been doing now for 15, 20, even more years, which started as a sort of a counter-narrative to the concept of the borderless world. You know, we're in a world of greater stability, harmony, there's no more Iron Curtain, the EU is expanding, uh, we're talking about a world without borders. And of course, we're not talking with, about a world without borders. Borders, their significances and functions are changing. They're not necessarily the physical borders of the walls and the fences. In many cases they are, but in many cases they're not. And even those of us who believe that we were moving in that direction 20 years ago, I think in the post 9-11 era, when we look at the three cases we're discussing here today, in all of which borders are tremendously significant and tremendously relevant, um, clearly uh, borders are out there. They're just, as I say, they're changing, but we're, we're not in a borderless world. We live in a world where borders impact upon us, both at the national state level and also at the individual and personal levels within cities, within neighborhoods, um, to a very great extent. I think one very important point to make when I think about uh, Brexit and about Israel-Palestine is that rightly, um, although that may be um, giving you a, a, a political position on my part, most of us looking at the case of Bre <laughs> Brexit and Ireland are very scared of the idea of a new border coming back, particularly because of the political consequences, maybe more even than the economic consequences. I mean, Israel-Palestine, those of us who have believed for a long time that you have to somehow fight your way into a two-state solution, and I'm going to make an argument here today why that is so difficult today, even for those of us who believe in it, but I think many of us who believe in that particular political position would be delighted to see a border, an agreed border, a bilateral border, not an imposed separation fence where it's unilaterally imposed by one side upon the other, whether they like it or not. But we would believe that if there were to be a bilateral border, which would include even such things as fences, that would mean that we've moved forward in a very significant way. And unfortunately, many of us think that we've moved backwards in the past uh, seven to eight years. As many of you know, we have in six, less than six weeks, five weeks time, we have elections in Israel. Um, I'm actually going to be here during that period, um, which is uh, unfortunate because I'm going to miss my chance of voting. Um, uh, but uh, we're going to have elections, and I'm sure those of you who follow the news from the Middle East know that uh, Mr. Netanyahu, Bibi as we commonly call him, um, is under threat. Um, not necessarily a right of centre coalition. There is unfortunately, oh, unfortunately, is a is a political position, but there, there is no left of center alternative in Israel today. There is a centrist alternative, but it's not a left of center alternative. Um, and given the fact that, as you're well aware, Mr. Netanyahu has uh, been indicted in the last few days for significant issues of economic issues, fraud issues, that has without a doubt weakened his electoral position. It may have weakened his own personal electoral position, and has also weakened his position in the sense that because Israeli governments have to be a coalition, there is never enough seats won by a single party to form a government on its own accord. You need a minimum of 61 out of the 120. There are a number of political leaders who have already intimated that even though they are centrist, centrist right, and they would not create a coalition with the left, but nevertheless, they've also made it very clear already that um, they would not want to form a coalition with an individual who is under investigation by the police. And that is going to, in my view, going to be, I'm not here to talk about the elections now, but that's going to be, in my view, a major issue the morning after the elections is how is the coalition government going to be put together? Which of the two parties, Mr. Netanyahu's Likud, or this new centrist party, what they are calling the General's Party, because three of the top four positions are former army commanders-in-chief, which is a very important position in Israeli society, given the conflict and the context of the conflict. Which of those is going to be the largest party? The largest party will be asked to try and put a coalition together. 
and will they or will they not um, go into a coalition with Mr Netanyahu? Just one interesting uh, fact that may uh, be of interest, and then we'll move on from the elections, to say that uh, come this April May, Mr Netanyahu will have served as Prime Minister for as long as the mythical state founder David Ben-Gurion. Um, in two, he was once Prime Minister, he was then defeated, he then came back, and he's been around for a long time. And that is a, uh, it's an amazing fact. I mean, uh, we may like Netanyahu, we may dislike Netanyahu, depending on our own political uh, preferences, um, but he has been a very long-serving Prime Minister. He knows his way around the political system. I think he feels very clearly that he's under threat today, that he may be losing that leadership now. The challenge hasn't yet come from within his own party, but it could well be if, he do, if either he is found guilty of the indictments um, or he doesn't become the largest single political leader. Now, there are two very different messages going around in this election. Netanyahu is being attacked by all the other parties because of the issues of indictment, of economic fraud, etc., etc. Um, he, in turn, is... <laughs> bringing the election discourse back to the issue of Israel, Palestinians, two states, peace, conflict, terrorism, etc., etc. It's very interesting that the other parties have not made this, they're not making this their central plank within the electoral campaign, if only because, and that's what I want to make as my main argument here, is to say that we don't really know where we stand on the two-state issue today. Um, many of us who have supported it for 20, 30 years as academics, as politicians, as people working in track two, feel that we may have missed the boat. But if we've missed the boat, what is the alternative? Are there alternatives? And that comes back very much to the issue of borders. Um, can you draw a border? Should there be a border? What is the significance and, and uh, implications of drawing a border under any future uh, peace resolution? So I want to talk a bit about the borders and about where we're thinking today. I'm assuming that this audience knows the history of the conflict, knows what the two-state solution is about, and I don't need to spend too much time explaining the basics. Um, so there's the map you all recognize, Israel and the occupied territories. Um, I, you know, I say to my students at SAU, do you, re you all know that Israel and the occupied territories are smaller than India, Pakistan. You know that. But do you know how much smaller? And they don't really know. Very few people in the world know that Israel and the entire occupied territories together is 25,000 square kilometers. OK, and when you put that into proportion, you realize um, how much noise a small country can make in global politics. Being small or large in size doesn't necessarily mean that you're small and large in the amount of uh, global positioning and world politics that you play, because Israel-Palestine, for right or for wrong, is always out there on the table for all sorts of reasons that we know why. So we have to put the perspective in place. The whole of the occupied territories, West Bank, Gaza Strip, and even the Golan Heights, of that 25,000 is 5,000 square kilometers. I mean, that's what we're talking about. And of course, uh, it's therefore very hard, even when you're saying, well, you know, India and Israel, or Israel-Palestine and India-Pakistan, both underwent partition. They both had the Brits leaving at about the same time, 47, 48. Uh, they both had population exchanges. They had many similar things going on which have implications until today, but uh, scale and size are not just different. They are vastly, vastly different. Um, one of the things we've been engaged in, of course, for 70 years, over 70 years, is this exercise, how do you take a very small piece of real estate and partition it between two competing peoples, both of whom lay claim to national sovereignty and to very classic nation states? Um, how do you do that? Remember, over 70 years, the population has grown exponentially. So today we're talking in the t uh, Israel and the occupied territories together. In the 10, 11 million people, when the state came into being in 48, we were talking at less than 2 million, even allowing for refugee outflow and refugee inflow. Um, power asymmetries 
have changed significantly because at that time we had a British mandate who played their normal game of divide and rule with both Arabs and Jews um, so that he, or, he, both, and I'm sure you know from this part of the world how relevant this is, both would always suspect the other side of receiving the benefits and be more suspicious of the other side than joining forces to get rid of the Brits. Um, the one thing that hasn't changed, of course, is the sheer territorial size. Territorial size has remained the same. They haven't started building thousands of kilometers into the sea. And so the territorial um, shape has remained the same, but population has grown exponentially. So the difficulty of drawing nice, clean lines has become increasingly difficult over time. I've been partially involved in this sort of game since Oslo and beforehand in the lots of track two situations and facts on the ground change. The number and the size of the settlements grow, the roads grow, the water becomes scarcer, the infrastructural resources become separated over scarcer population base and therefore it becomes increasingly difficult even if you support a two-state solution as the best of all the bad solutions um, to actually implement it on ground. There are of course um, different types of opposition to two states. There is the ideological opposition which has been out there for a long time. So either you have people on the far right in Israel, people who are very prominent in today's Israeli government have become increasingly prominent over the past five or six years and could well remain at least as prominent under the next government, who are opposed to two-state solutions because they say, no, this is all of it belongs to us. Historical reasons, religious reasons, strategic reasons, you name them, it's all ours, it shouldn't be a Palestinian state. So you've always had that ideological opposition. If in the past Netanyahu used to be more of a hardliner in his own governments, today he's seen even as being a moderate within his own government, given the nature of some of the people who share the government table with the cabinet table with him. There's also ideological opposition from the far left. The far left in Israeli politics, or what they call the radical left, <clears throat> and many of the Palestinians themselves will say, oh, no, we're in, we don't need two states on this piece of territory like this. We need a single binational secular democracy between the Mediterranean and Jordan River, and uh, there will be elections, and there will be democracy, um, and we don't need to start drawing lines in an era where it's so difficult to draw these lines. But it should be said that well over 90% of the Israeli stroke Jewish population which makes up 80% of the population of the State of Israel, are opposed to this, even those people on the left who support withdrawal from the territories, who support two states. Um, the average, and I, I know it's a very difficult thing to talk about, Mr. or Mrs. Average Israeli citizen. Um, you all know the famous jokes of two Israelis or two Jews, five opinions. That's pretty true of when it comes to elections. Um, then most of them are opposed to the idea of a single... Uh, by a national state, and uh, public surveys show that most Israelis, again I say Israeli stroke Jewish population, when they ask what is the one most important thing they need out of a peace solution, they want to retain, for whatever reasons, um, historical reasons, religious reasons, they want to ensure that there is a, a Jewish state with a Jewish majority. Um, and that goes for many of the people who support the withdrawal from the territories, and that is a, a basic issue out there. So. Which is why we get involved in these games of drawing lines, of drawing cartographies. And in a very similar version, going back to Oslo 25 years ago, um, I like, by the way, caricatures of maps and borders. Um, you know, this is 25 years ago. Here you have Mr. Rabin, who was Prime Minister, Arafat, Hussein the father, Assad the father. Um, at the time of Oslo, Basically, Rabin saying to a map of it, or the map of Israel saying to Rabin, the map of Israel with a stomach too large like I have, um, with including the, including the West Bank, saying to Mr. Rabin, the stern trainer, how much of this shape do I need to change to shed to please all of the spectators sitting around that gym? And basically, if you're thinking still of a very pragmatic version of the two-state solution, that is still very much the question which is on the table if and when it was to be brought back on the table and it's not on the table at the moment. What is tremendously ironic about how these things come together and how this impacts upon 
the forthcoming elections, here you have a new centrist party which has been created. Three of the top four members of that have been the last three commanders-in-chief of the Israeli army, all of whom served under and were appointed by Netanyahu governments. And what has Netanyahu come out and said about them is, these are left-wingers, they're going to sacrifice the security of the State of Israel. You know, only I am Mr. Security and will hold on to the security and strategic assets. And I think, by the way, he's done himself a misfavor by selling that argument because he's not saying it about what we would call the Labour Party or the Merits Party on the left. He's saying it about a centrist party where people are going to vote for them precisely because these people do have a security and do have a strategic background as commanders-in-chief of the Israeli army, which is still considered by Mr. and Mrs. Centrist or mainstream Israeli as being a very important asset, <coughs> asset for as long as the conflict remains a principal issue on the uh, Israeli table of politics. Um, Israel has experienced a huge number of borders over a short period of time. I won't even start reading through this list, but you know, it started just a hundred years ago. Now, a hundred years ago, the First World War ended. Break up, not just in Europe, but the Ottoman Empire. We all know the history of sykes Pico and the, and the San Remo Agreement. And then you had the mandates, and then you had the withdrawal of Britain, you had Israel's War of Independence or the Palestinian Nakba, you had the Palestinian, um, United Nations Partition Proposal, which was different as a result of the war. You had the 67 war, where the territories were, depending on your political persuasions, were conquered, occupied, liberated, administered, whichever term you like to use, but the territorial outcome was the same thing. You had the Camp David Peace Accords, withdrawal of Sinai. You had the unilateral withdrawal of Gaza. You've had a huge number of borders in a very short period of time. And one of the things that borders tell us, whether we're looking back at World War I or we're looking just at Israel-Palestine, is that borders which never existed in history become sacrosanct in a very short period of time. So that the Green Line boundary between Israel and the West Bank is the default boundary. Someone who doesn't want to negotiate about boundaries will always say, well, let's just go back to the default position. That default position existed for less than 19 years, from 1948 to 67. They weren't ideal boundaries then. And if you were to have true bilateral negotiations going on, not one side imposing its story on the other side, the stronger imposing on the weaker, you really need to rethink the whole of the border because the green line may be a default for a short period of time, but it is as non-ideal a boundary for a two-state solution as perhaps it was when it was drawn up, or well, maybe it was more ideal in 49 because it was drawn up in the Rhodes Agreements as reflecting the realities of then, realities have changed. And I think one of the things we often forget when we talk about two-state solutions and borders is the fact that between the establishment of Israel and the Six-Day War in 67, a period of less than 19 years passed, 18 to 19 years. From the Six-Day War until today, we've had nearly three times as long. You know, another few years will be up to 60. Uh, two years ago, they were talking about 50 years since the Six-Day War. What has happened on the ground, and I'm not coming to justify this, um, and I'm not coming to say it's legal or illegal, but what has happened on the ground in the 52 years since the Six-Day War has changed the geographical and territorialities to such an extent far more than ever occurred between 48 and 67 when basically the two territories were completely separated uh, from each other because of the nature of the divide at the time. And I do believe that if you were to get back to real bilateral negotiations, you have to take this into account. You can have as many historical arguments as you want as who was right and who was wrong, who were the greater victim, who committed greater injustices, and you will never resolve that argument even 50 years after a peace agreement is signed. But if you want to get back to the reality of geopolitics and of drawing boundaries where both sides realize they have to compromise, not just over territorial issues, I speak about borders because I'm interested in territorial issues, but there are so many other issues to do with refugees and resources and water and Jerusalem 
and um, just a few other, you know, minor, I say, uh, issues. Um, if both sides have to compromise, they have to rethink the way that borders are drawn and whether borders are the right, the sort of borders that we think about in national politics, are they the right solution? Will they require populations to get up and go? Um, many will say that the half a million settlers in the West Bank have to get up and go back to Israel. Easier said than done, even if you believe it's the right thing in terms of historical legitimacy. No Israeli government, even if there were to be a return of a left-wing government, which is not going to be in the next five to ten years because of public opinion, is able to get up and remove four to five hundred thousand Israeli residents, settlers of the West Bank. And the left-wing know this very well, and therefore they don't really want to have to deal with this problem, even if you redraw boundaries and you're talking about a quarter of a million instead of half a million. Then you have the far right wing who come along and say, ha, oh, you want us to remove settlers. Well, we want to remove Israeli-Palestinian citizens who reside in Israel. You want to go back to two states because you want to keep a clear majority, demographic ethnic majority. Well, let's do it even more so. And you have people like the person who's the very right wing, defense minister until recently, Avigdor Lieberman, who says, yes, we'll redraw the boundaries in such a way that instead of having an 80-20 ratio between Jews and Israelis and Palestinians in Israel, we'll have a 90-10 ratio, regardless of the fact that every public survey that is undertaken amongst the Palestinian residents of Israel make it clear they're not interested. Obviously, they support the establishment of a Palestinian state, but they're not interested in being part of that, at least not in the first stages, where they're not clear what sort of state, what sort of government, what sort of democracy is going to go on there. Um, we can't go through all the history of borders. Uh, this is one, by the way, I must just show you as an aside. I found by chance, I, I love this one, because it's a, a quirk. And that is, um, I found it in the house of a colleague of mine in Kentucky, a professor of geography by the name of Stan Broom, who I found when I visited him last year, collects plates with maps on them. And he had this one, which was issued in 47. Now, this is... An amazing plate, because you may remember the United Nations voted on borders in the 1947 partition resolution. There was a war which followed, and the borders were different. This plate talks about the Republic of Israel, May the 14th, 1948, the day that the state was established, but it has the boundaries of the partition resolution on it. So this plate was issued in a very short time period of about six to eight months when the War of Independence was taking, or the Nakba, was taking place, and it is a real collector's item. And I've told Stan that if no one takes up his collection when he reaches the grand age of 120 and moves on elsewhere, I want that plate left to me as an inheritance. But it, it says something very remarkable about the way we think of boundaries and borders and maps and so on. The only real boundary, as I say, which has been implemented has been the Green Line. That became sacrosanct in a very short period of time. Um, it is still the formal administrative boundary, but of course it was open, you could say, in 67. But in the last 10, 15 years, it's been replaced by the separation barrier, by the security separation barrier, wall, fence, whatever you want to call it. The wall is about 7-8% um, of the fence. It's mostly fence, but of course the pictures we see, particularly around Jerusalem, are pictures of the wall. Um, what that has done though in Israel is something very interesting. It's brought the concept of border back as part of a public narrative. Because before then they used to talk about two states, they used to talk about the Green Line, but you never used to see anything visibly with your eyes. Because Israel is such a small country, because there's a new cross-Israel highway running north to south, a huge number of Israelis who never go into the West Bank, the vast majority, maybe 20 minutes away from their own, but never go near there and never go in there unless they're doing their army duty or unless they're a right-wing settler. Now drive up and down in Israel and see, as they're driving up and down a few hundred meters away on their right or left, depending on which direction you're driving, they see a fence and a wall. And that has brought back the reality of what it means to have a border, which means it's much more part of the public discourse today than it ever was in the, in, in, in the past. And, um, I'd love, and 
But I think that one of the questions we need to understand is that we often think that, you know, you can take a piece of paper, you could draw a line. You know, what did Ratcliffe do in this part of the world when he came for his only visit of six weeks? And what a, he drew a single line and caused a bit of a mess. Um, but borders are very complex issues because, as Emmanuel rightly said, there are different borders for different functions. And the border which ensures the security for Israel doesn't necessarily ensure security for Palestinians. And a border which ensures security doesn't necessarily give um, a solution to the issues of residency and citizenship. Where do you belong? Who do you belong to? What side of the boundary? And so on. So today we have to ask the question as to whether we have lost the capability of drawing um, a single border, particularly when you look at these cheese board maps of the Oslo Accords, which left the West Bank divided up into areas A, B, and C, because even then Israeli governments couldn't deal with the issue of settlement evacuation. So they left it to be determined at a future date, along with issues such as refugees, as Jerusalem, as water. And we know future dates never came about because basically the Oslo process collapsed, um, certainly as a territorial solution. <coughs> and we have to ask ourselves that if we are unable to draw borders, clear, easily drawable borders today, what, if at all, are the alternatives? Well, one alternative is to say, forget about the two-state solution. That's one alternative out there. Another alternative is to say, can you think beyond the territorial box, beyond borders, beyond the classic concept of a border dividing peoples? Um, back in the 70s, there was a very well-known American political scientist, Dan Elazar, one of the world's authorities on federalism, who then came to live in Israel during the latter part of his career and tried to apply his concepts of federalism and confederalism to Israel-Palestine at a much easier stage than it is today. And he was laughed out of town because they said, what does he know? He's an American. He doesn't understand the complexity of what's going on there. And no one paid attention to what he wrote. Today, people are talking about those ideas again. The idea of, can you have power sharing without drawing lines? Can you have power sharing without the need to talk about movement of peoples, even though it's not symmetrical when you're talking about movements of different types of peoples here? and when and how they got to where they're living today. But given the realities of how difficult it would be to implement, can you have the um, forms of power sharing where you don't draw single lines? Can you create states out of exclaves and enclaves? Seems really complex. And it seems really impossible given the level of animosity and fear and mistrust that people would have of each other and of their territorial neighbors given the complexity of the conflict of the last 20, 30, and 50 years. But we are asking questions today as uh, regarding of, if we get back to this table, if after the next election, the new centrist generals party gets back there and are prepared to try and get back to the table, which it does not appear at the moment, and I could be wrong, I'm not a spokesman for the government, um, I'm certainly not a spokesman for Mr. Netanyahu. It doesn't seem to me that the Netanyahu-led government is going to want to get back there to the table, uh, particularly as they today are even attacking the two-state solution. But if you were to have an alternative government, if you were to have a centrist government of people who are trusted on security issues because of their military past and who are prepared and want to get back to talking about political solutions, can you go back to the ideas of a single line? Probably not. And if not, we have to ask the question of what lies beyond the territorial trap of simple two-state solution. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, as if this is not complex enough, I think we'll also have a look at the Indian border questions and uh, now Joita, please. Uh, thank you, Britta, for giving me this opportunity to share uh, this space. I is with two makes a patient patient and uh, it's a stalwart on border studies and I feel uh, extremely honored. Well, they have really made uh, wonderful presentations, one on what could happen uh, when you've been united, then you decide to be separated. 
the case of Brexit, and what could be the economic cost, which when we think of border, we, nearly, we really don't think about what could be the cost of non-cooperation. And exactly, I'm very glad that Emmanuel has exactly brought light to that, an issue that I, will, I always think of, what will happen when we really don't think about, because everywhere in a world of globalization, we try to think everything with numbers. And when it comes to border cooperation, it is very important that we should think about what happens when we decide to go ahead with non-cooperation. Secondly, again, David presentation, fascinating. I was thinking uh, about you know a couple of questions, how we really deal with the two-state issue, the questions. And India, as such, was you know, we at one, of, one point of time, and we are still dealing with those lot of things. There have been a lot of similarities. Uh, well, uh, when it comes to Indian borders, normally people uh, talk about uh, India-Pakistan borders. That's always been uh, the issue. But today, I would like to draw your attention to a different part of the border, which is the eastern border. But definitely, it's not China. And here, I would try to draw a case study. What happens when we decide to get separated, and we are trying to get back together and understand how we can really go back. But really, the line which has been drawn way back in 70 years back, whether we can really overcome it, what has been the impact on the society and all. So I would try to focus on India's eastern border, looking mostly into India-Bangladesh border. And also, I will try to uh, understand the, uh, mostly the border question and the challenges in the BBIN context. Uh, we all know when, uh, in 1947, uh, one gentleman uh, in an airport, in fact, one, uh, one of my colleagues narrated the story that one gentleman who, was, uh, who, who is from Bangladesh, he was coming in, and he was standing in the border, uh, in the immigration, and, he, and it was taking some time. So he asked that, you know, we are the same person. You speak the same language and same, but still, we have. I have to come through. It's just 20 minutes fly from Dhaka to Kolkata, and I have to cross the uh, immigration every time. It takes half an hour flight. I spend half an hour in the immigration. So that immigration officer, very joke, very uh, nicely said, you know, nothing can be done. Only it is all because of that small thing that happened in 1947. 47, our one whole country, which was that whole India, by the stroke of midnight, our country was separated. And South Asia, which was known as India, the British India, the big continent, became into three, uh, first into two parts, then into three parts. But what happened after that? It is, whether it was, uh, of course, it was a political decision. But really, that political decision uh, was only, it was political, but also it affected our psychology. But I would say that line which was created because of some political decision may not be the people were involved directly, but it does impact the people as such, and it divided our minds also. Uh, almost, um, and definitely, uh, um, it, it, one of the why I say divided our mind also because in 1971 we fought, Bangladesh fought the war of liberation and India was support, supporting it. In fact, we shed blood with Bangladesh. Having said so, even for almost, but still the border re, the border didn't go. It remained. In fact, it became more prevalent, and we had to bring up the barbed wire. You know, we we had to erect the barbed wire fencing, which is very important. So it really created, uh, so because the moment we create a fence, we, it really showcases that border which was not, uh, it, which was there in the mind, it becomes very prevalent to us. And it hurts every time. And it really divided the society. Um, us, and we have seen there has been problems in India and Bangladesh. We should not be. And there has been issue of terrorism. There has been uh, issue of uh, uh, drug trades and a lot. But more than that, there was the feeling of antagonism, which was very, very um, 
effective and very prevalent among the people. However, I would say, the, uh, while India-Bangladesh was going on on that, uh, there was also the other countries in the region, uh, especially the eastern borders, the BBI, and we had open borders with Nepal and Bhutan. Uh, but uh, since they were small countries, <laughs> despite um, we had open borders and Nepal and Bhutan, we ha uh, but still, uh, uh, they had, it created a lot of uh, you know, socio-economic bonding among the so societies. But that kind of bonding, Bangladesh wanted to have also together. And there, among all this, there was the idea of creating a South Asian Union also existed in the region. Uh, while, uh, so there, and then we created CERC. Unfortunately, as I said, the division of the mind became so prevalent that we really could not overcome that. And even after trying for regional cooperation under CERC, it did not go ahead. Uh, but since uh, there was an understanding, and there, but Bangladesh, and so in uh, so in 2015, an important event took place in history of South Asia. I would say, first, India and Bangladesh decided to change their mind, change the history, and they really went ahead and tried to resolve the border issues. It, it was more like an effort to unite the world, in fact, to probably they tried to recreate or redraw the history together and more for a positive outcome. And you can see we peacefully resolved our Indo-Bangladesh border, not only the land border, also the maritime border peacefully, which is indeed a great, great achievement, I would say. But having said so, we, form, so we thought, let's go ahead, let's write in history together. and. We created, uh, we tried to do something under CERC. CERC was, un uh, was not fair because probably our Western, still our ma wounds were so uh, deep that we could not overcome the, uh, the whole thing in the entire South Asia. But these four countries tried to, uh, tried to overcome it. And they, they created a sub-regional cooperation called PBIN, Bangladesh, Bhutan, India, sub-regional cooperation. And under that thing, the one most important thing that took place was signing of the MVA, Motor Vehicle Agreement, between these four countries. We thought this will be a wonderful thing together. We really can circumvent the, bo the border issue. We can surpass it. And one fine day, a dream for many that one day we will be able to drive from New Delhi to Dhaka to Northeast India, just like that. And sim similarly, from Kathmandu to Dhaka in a very easy way. So, uh, so we, create, we, we thought and beautiful, and it was a wonderful occasion. But unfortunately, as I said, that the mind, and similarly, I would say that much to the credit of the governments together, uh, particularly in India and Bangladesh, in fact, India took the lead. And there was a lot of efforts to build up the border infrastructures and everything. But once the mind is divided, it is always, it's very difficult, because division of the mind is more uh, harmful than anything else. We see that despite that great idea, the BBIN could not took its position the way we wanted it. The Bhutan moved back because almost 70 years we have spent, we have we remained div divided. We could not think about that composite region which existed much before uh, 1947 uh, because uh, 1947 and that really created. So Bhutan mo moved back, and also we tried after some time various political uh, issues emerging in India's, um, especially within India, which really made us think about what is, what is it, whether this great idea can really we move forward. Because before uh, the issue was the issues of citizenship, the native, the right of the native people started emerging in uh, overall discourse um, of the border in India's Northeast, which is very important for understanding Indian Eastern neighbors. So what we do? There was a big question, because the government of India, they thought, OK, uh, Northeast is alienated, and we can bring back all through all these connectivity issues and all. But what happens? It is the division of mind that happened. We created, because of the 
partition. We created and such an issue of citizenship issue, the native divides and all. It is very difficult to overcome because now people have become, because for more than 70 years, they have remained in a closed, uh, as, uh, in a closed, I would say in an almost a closed state, uh, situation that they are unable to think beyond to understand that the moment we open our windows, it's not only opening, uh, I won't say that we were opening our borders, but we are trying to help to make uh, the movement in the region much, much easier, which is very important. Uh, and that way the border, also we were thinking that we will be able to make our border irrelevant, uh, absolutely irrelevant in the region, but it didn't happen. Recently, we have seen the question of citizenship bill uh, is a very, very big issue that emerged. And the natives started to talk about their natives' rights. And uh, so these are the threats that emerged. So how do we handle this issue? Should the question em emerges, can we really go back where from we started? Or we should continue with the process? I think it is a very big issue that right now is emerging uh, in every uh, among everybody in India, especially in that region who are thinking about sub-region, thinking about a borderless region. Borderless may not be, the sovereignty remains the same. In fact, we at ORF, a couple of uh, years back, when the BBIN came in, we thought, let's talk about how we can deal with the border issues. And we organized a conference here, just in this uh, room itself where the people were great, open about the ideas, but when we said, let's think about together, let's work together, somewhere or the other, our newly acquired sense of sovereignty somewhere stopped us from thinking, going back to that uh, region where we all belonged way back in the, uh, prior to our colonial time. So what do we do? What we can do? I think it is time for us to sit and think how we can move forward. Can we, the people of South Asia, can think of an united region, keeping our sovereignty intact, and how do we rethink our borders? Borders should not be the dividers. The borders should be placed where we all unite. Thank you very much. Um, Hegel, Georg Friedrich Wilhelm, the philosopher, once famously said that what, the moment you draw a border, you are already beyond it. But uh, that also means that when you are beyond it, you always have the option to come back. And it seems that we are trapped in uh, this movement of uh, drawing borders and uh, dissolving them and coming back to them. Um, uh, I think we have a lot uh, on the table now, and I'd like to open uh, this up. Uh, for discussion, if you um, can uh, introduce yourself before you ask a question. Uh, we have for the people sitting on the sides, we also have some hand microphones there, otherwise you have your mics here. I think I'll collect three questions and uh, then, uh, yes, we'll do another round later. So first the gentleman here, then you, and anybody else in the first round? Yes, please. I'm a physician from China. It's good to see you. Like India has a tricolor bubble. Please put paper perspective here. My first question is to Canadians. You said that every Northern Ireland citizen is entitled to become an Irish passport. Does it indirectly mean that everybody living in England or Welsh or Scottish because they have got the right to come to the Northern Ireland? Yes, is, yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. So, uh, Mr. David, it's really nice because if at all there is one problem that could be solved in the world is that is your problem. You think it can be? Certainly, it has to. Nothing is impossible in medicine. Okay, I don't know. Maybe in politics it's the same. It could be, yeah. We need little with wide which See, in, what about inter I mean, marriages between the Jewish and the Palestinians? And again, is there a way that we could have, as you rightly said, our motherland has speedily and hastily amputated. You talked about the union, I mean, Nepal and Bangladesh. Could it be possible for us to amalgamate Pakistan as well? Is there, because there is one 
communist uh, uh, bengali in england i forgot his name his vision is that we should have a common border and common currency like what we learned from the eu i don't know of course brexit is not a right time but we the south asians could have a currency and a borderless world. only that uh, that alone can lift us from the poverty thank you very much Uh, I'm Radhika, I'm a research intern here. So my question is that what is the long-term policy solution of the Bangladeshi uh, immigrants that are entering Assam, basically? Hello, my name is Navneet Manwara, and I represent Fixed Portal. Okay, okay. Navneet Bhatnagar. See, my questions are to uh, Professor David and to Ms. Jyoti. Joita, sorry. Uh, see, whenever we talk of, say, incidentally, you talk, uh, talked of three eyes, you know, between the three eyes, there are two P's also, you know, Palestine and Pakistan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, my question is, see, when we talk of the two-state uh, issue, basically, in uh, Israel, you know, basically, we are talking of Israel and Israel territory and the West Bank territory. Now, in this discourse, normally the Gaza Strip is not discussed. So maybe if you would feel, uh, you know, worthwhile to shed some light on it, how is the position there? Would it also be considered or whatever, you know, whatever the thoughts are there? And number two, my question to uh, you, Ms. Bhattacharji. <coughs> See, if you drive down towards your north, uh, northeast India, you know, Darjeeling and Bhutan and Funchiling area, <coughs> You find a lot of cars with Bhutan numbers and Nepal numbers over there. Uh, the government of India had started off with the motor vehicle leg where they wanted a consolidated, so the Bangladesh cars could come over here and cars from <coughs> Calcutta could go over there. Uh, now you, uh, the thought is there that the, we want to have a consolidated connectivity, etc. But why is it not? You have not probably, if you could elaborate upon the reasons why it has not been done, you know, the basic technical reasons why it has not been done. We want to have a mm -hmm. railway line. They made a try, you know, the, from, because earlier the trains used to go only from uh, Calcutta to via Dhaka to um, um, Assam. So they have tried. So why, why is it stuck up? So probably if you could shed light on it. Thank you so much. It only applies to people in Northern Ireland. But they're resident of Northern Ireland. Most of them are born on the island as well. Right? That's the main difference. I'm going to relate to his specific question. Um, I have four children who have the right to an Irish passport because their grandfather was from Dublin. And um, one of them actually already has one, but he got it four years ago, for long before Brexit was ever heard of, because he went to Latin South America for the summer of the World Cup. And he found it, that it was very difficult to get tickets for the games on either a British or an Israeli passport, much easier on an Irish passport, so that's why he took out Irish citizenship. <laughs> and there were many thousands who did it like him. So, and, and then if that happens, I will end up being the only member in my family without a European passport. So as a Remainer, I'm very jealous of them. Not that they're taking up the option. Okay, back to the less serious stuff. Um, Gaza Strip, you know, often when I give even longer lectures on Israel Palestine, I always know there's certain things, if I don't touch upon them in the lecture, they're going to be asked. What about Jerusalem? What about the Gaza Strip? You know, so obviously you can't cover everything in a very short period of time. Um, it's always been accepted that the two-state solution means the Gaza and the West Bank are part of a single solution, even though there's a territorial separator between them. Um, that, I think, is still part of the thinking, even though, of course, that the politics of each of those areas has changed significantly in the last 10 years, with Hamas basically ruling Gaza. And at the moment, the West Bank is still under the control of the Palestinian Authority, but there are people there. I mean, Palestinian society, just like Israeli society, is not homogeneous. 
I mean, neither is Palestinian society. And I mean, uh, it's very classic for Israelis to come and say, look at all our differences of opinion and how we raise all differences. And look at the Arabs, the Palestinians, they all think the same. They don't all think the same, full stop. It just shows the lack of knowledge about what is going on there. And there is certainly a, a, a sense of uh, uh, mistrust within much of the West Bank about, you know, would what happened in Gaza, could it happen in the West Bank? Or the other way around, in Gaza there's also beginning to be not a little bit of dissatisfaction from what Hamas haven't delivered, in, 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 etc. But I think on the table, the, the two are still talked of as being part of a single solution with, with the need to find some sort of territorial combination. Now, in the immediate years after the Oslo Accords, 93 to about 98, 99, when it was still thought that something could come out of this, um, there were three, what they called at the time, safe route passages organized between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank. Three on paper, two in practice. Why? Why? Because the third would have gone through Jerusalem and Israel didn't want that to happen because it would have threatened what they see as their control over a wider or greater Jerusalem. But there were two which did the work and for as long as the beginnings of the Oslo process were working out until they were eventually destroyed by spoilers on both sides, um, you had tens of thousands of people literally moving daily between the Gaza Strip and the West Bank, normally from the Gaza to the West Bank for reasons of employment, for reasons of education, and back in the evening, and it worked. And when the whole political solution came collapsing and crashing down, then that didn't work either. And I think it's very important to know that you know things like that are often raised as a big problem. When leaders on both sides want an agreement to work, those issues become minor. When they don't want it to work, they become the major issues around which everything collapses. So I'm not saying it's ideal, it's certainly not ideal territorially, and obviously Israel isn't going to go for a solution which means it doesn't control its own territory with some break in the middle, but it is workable. It's not ideal, but it is workable. That's a, um, there have been one or two people who, because of what's happened with Hamas and the PLO, say we need to think of a three-state solution. I don't see that happening. Um, uh, you know, Gaza would be... Uh, by the way, Gaza's territorial size and population, you can compare it to Singapore, and everyone says Gaza could be the Middle East Singapore. Uh, but we're a bit of a way off from there at the moment, if, if I could say. Um, you talk about intermarriage... What is the third, third uh, state, what do you say? Gaza, Palestine, what do you say? That? No, I'm saying Israel, oh, Gaza okay. Strip, and, and the West Bank. Yes. Um, there is very little intermarriage between Jews and Arabs in Israel. There is a minor... It's perceived as being something very negative, uh, not just because of political national reasons, because the whole context of Jewish culture is, is that you marry within the religion. Um, what is more interesting within Israeli Jewish society is the intermarriage which takes place between people from a European Ashkenazic extraction and from a Sephardic or Mizrahi extraction. Three of my four children are married. Two of them are married to daughters of people who came to Israel from the Yemen, and we obviously came from Western Europe. That in itself is interesting, but that, in a joking sense, is how we describe intermarriage in Israel today. Um, that's not going to bring forth the solution, even though there are cases, I mean, not an insignificant number of cases of uh, Jewish-Arab intermarriage, but um, uh, as I say, it's seen very negatively within both societies um, as such. But don't they get along well? They, they, they get the friendship, there's the words. The United Friends of Benetta came out of the booklet. There are people who become so friends and they bribe each other and like that. Uh, the context I would listen, <laughs> when you work in the sort of world I work in, which is sort of uh, academia, track two, pro-peace networks, you have a lot of colleagues and networking and friends and so on. But that is minimal. There is very little interaction, real daily life interaction between Jews and Africa. They live in segregated communities. Within the so-called mixed cities, they tend to live in separate neighborhoods. And uh, I think that is always going to be the case for as long as the conflict is out there. What happens post-conflict if we ever reach that situation, you know, is a big question mark, because you would like to think that will bring about a gradual move towards greater interaction, greater cooperation, uh, greater normalization. I think we often make the mistake of always throwing this term peace process out and say peace means a lot of different things. We need to reach the first stages of conflict resolution. 
where both sides can reach an agreeable solution where neither side is faced by the fear of threat from the other. If it's one from terrorists on the one side or army tanks on the other side. Live through that for a whole generation. Have a whole generation of children being born into a post-conflict situation. Let's get back and talk about the next stages of normalization. But we're not even there yet. Well, I have two questions. One is uh, rather a borderless South Asia or bringing Pakistan. Sir, I think the idea was very much there. Otherwise, sir, could not have happened. Because the very beginning, when I was in the smaller neighbors, the idea of an united South Asia, because SARC was created ultimately to reach somewhere as South Asian Union. Unfortunately, under present situation, it is not happening. And we all know why SARC is not working. But SARC is not that, sir. It is a process that we have to continue. Maybe not now, we have to give time because what we have faced for almost 100 years, it's not easy to override. And still, even in the BBIN context, we have tried, but still, we, despite the posit positive will from the government side, the pressure of democracy among the governments, here I would come, the Bhutan side, you know, why a BBIN India? Because Bhutan agreed, when after the CERC summit in Kathmandu, when the, all the four countries came together and thought of creating an BBIN, Bhutan also agreed. One they, once they went back, they faced opposition. And it was the pressure of the <coughs> democracy, because right now Bhutan is a democracy. And in the democracy, democratic country, the government have to take note of the public opinion. It was the people of the Bhutan who were opposing it. Uh, and maybe of the record, I can share further details, because I have to really. But right now, Bhutan opposed it, because uh, they say that it is the environmental issue, but there was also other economic issue, I suppose. You know, probably the, uh, probably some other, because in Bhutan, tourism is a major issue, and I also say the motor vehicle, the taxi services and all play a major, major uh, role. So there, like, there are a lot of issues, but apparently it is thing, but it was the people who, so that's why I say it probably despite, because for, seven, for so many years we remain divided, Despite having an open border, we were unable to overcome that openness of mind. <laughs> that was the reason. Uh, uh, you questioned uh, immigration. Huh? First, you tell me, at least uh, I'm working for this issue. I grew up in the border region, and almost a uh, decade now I'm working on the borders. Uh, I haven't heard much about there was immigration in Assam. But till now, there uh, illegal migration, not immigration, illegal, migra illegal migration. Uh, there, there was an issue, definitely, I would not overcome. But till now, I don't know what is the definite number. And if my research is correct, definitely there has been a substantial reduction in the flow of migration in Assam. Migration might happen because we live in a, comp the way the society, our region is, it's a natural process for everywhere it might take place. Neither we also in India could prove whether there was illegal migration happening or not. And in, so when we are thinking of this, and it's been a process, but in Assam, I don't know the way it has been hyped. Uh, at least uh, probably intensity has reduced. This much I can say. Thank you. Anybody else, or no? Otherwise, we take it one by one. That's fine. My Thank question you. is to Bhattacharya. You said after the partition in 1947. You so introduce yourself. The psychological minds are divided, Indians and Pakistanis. So what you, what is the solution for that? They can their thinking or the way they communicate can be changed. This is a question I am also looking forward to. I'll be happy if, you, if somebody can give me that answer because I am a researcher. I am, I am looking for that answer. If I can get that answer, probably I can suggest so do you it. Think there, you. Uh, to, me, it uh, to me, it seems that there should be more cultural exchange of programs between India and Pakistan, people-to-people -people contact between India and Pakistan. As far as army and defense forces between India and Pakistan are concerned, 
Pakistani forces, their very existence is based on against India. And after 1947, the democracy in Pakistan is for a very short, short periods in between. Most of the time, it is the, it is the defense forces which rule Pakistan. So if the people's to people contacts, keeping the defense forces aside in Pakistan, people to people contact and exchange of programs, cultural programs between India and Pakistan takes place. Perhaps that psycho, psychological divide may change. This is the way I think. Yeah, I need your comments. I think uh, this subject, uh, maybe it's not at this level, this has to be addressed at the political level. Uh, so maybe uh, within this forum, within this conference room, it's not the right uh, uh, forum to address this particular uh, aspect. No, definitely, I will answer. Because that. everybody would have his own point. Uh, I, I will answer, I will answer, I, I will answer. <laughs> Uh, so thank you for your inputs. Uh, uh, right now, uh, I think, sir, uh, I, as a person who study um, humanity and humanism, I would always try to see we, we should have more people-to-people -people context, more connectivity. But, sir, the reality of the world also needs to be addressed. And that is something which... Uh, uh, probably we have to continue with the processes, but reality is important and we have to address because whatever we say, the government matters, the politics matters, the army also matters. So this is not, and I look, and I am not the right person to give a detailed answer because I look more into the Eastern neighbors and that is my uh, forte. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, sir. Uh, Ameya Kelkar, Research Assistant at ORF. Regarding Brexit, and this question is for Dr. Emmanuel, the entire Brexit thing was started because David Cameron got on stage and said, let's have a referendum. And then a bus told a gigantic lie across London, and then the referendum happened. And now the people don't want Brexit because literally two days after Brexit, the first Google search was, what is Brexit? What does it mean to leave the EU? <laughs> so. My main question is, what is stopping the Conservative government from actually pulling out another referendum and saying, let's leave it to the people again? And secondly, what, does, what do they hope to get out of this? Your presentation has shown it's going to be an economic um, disaster. Yes. Yeah, disaster. disaster, to put it in a diplomatic way. Um, people are going to be affected, lives are uncertain. Even before Brexit, lives, are, uh, lives and uh, opportunities are uncertain. People don't know where they're going to go. So what does the government hope to get out of it besides territorial integrity and a false and a sense of immigration control? Thank you. The whole issue is internal to the Conservative Party, right? There is no doubt about this. So even May is struggling with this issue. It's her party that may disappear. Or she has to find a compromise that satisfies the most extreme and the mainstream within her own party. This is why there are so many people in continental Europe that are so upset with uh, the people who are part of this party and represent, in a way, a segment of the British elite. Um, you know, Brexiters have been um, in journalism, in many different professions. You even have Brexiters that have already uh, moved their assets um, outside of the country and so on and so forth. So the, the agenda is really ideological. And, and I think that Tusk, the president of the EU, who's you know, former prime minister of Poland, but has been president of the EU now for a number of years, said it very well. Because um, uh, when, he's, when he basically exploded, a couple of weeks ago and said that there is a special place in hell for Brexiters that are unprepared. <laughs> he did publicly say something very close to this. Um, the consequences were not ever looked at before. And there was much, there was, I mean, this is why I'm looking at very, I'm, I'm looking at very specific issues 
I first of all, I looked at the question, which is what I presented at September here. I looked at the question of the, the real cost of Brexit from the perspective of EU contribution. So is there a benefit to the EU? Is there a benefit to the UK coming out of the Brexit? And that's the first part of a paper, the, which is also about the cost, but shows that when you narrow it down, the UK real contribution was one, about 1 billion euro per year. The discussion evolved between five and eight. But when you get down to looking at all the details, it's about 1 billion a year. And my current estimates evolved between, it's going to cost them 80 to 120 years to pay that bill. Because that's the, the real cost of Brexit is going to be new custom, new immigration facilities, internal reorganization to the UK, huge cost bared by the private sector. But that's, you know, that's not all. There is a legal bill behind this. And I have contacts with lawyers who are working with them. And I have done interviews with lawyers who cost a fortune these are people who make my salary in two days of advising the UK government. And we are, do we are dealing with you know, dozens of people who are extremely expensive, who are, for instance, the whole issue of the delay. You probably all heard about this, right? Pushing um, the March deadline by maybe 30 days or 90 days. There may be a court case against the government in uh, the European Court on that issue, which will cost them even more money. So drafting all of the new treaties, negotiating them is very expensive. They were not prepared. And so the list is very long, right? But it's originally, it's really an ideological view, belonging or not to Europe, for very radical members of the Conservative Party who, who have had huge clout and who are you know, deniers, but they didn't do their homework. They didn't look at, okay, what does this mean first? They just went and campaigned. And uh, yes, I mean, everybody agrees now that a lot of the information used during the campaign was made up. It didn't really add any reality, so yeah. So in addition to that, even people in Theresa May's party, the Conservative Party, So what is Theresa May in particular looking at, you know, when she says that she's all for Brexit, what in particular is she looking at? Madame May? Yeah, she, I think she, does, she wants to protect her own party from breaking up, basically. That's what she's been working on. The whole difficulty, even the whole issue of, for instance, having an open vote and, for instance, you know, basically um, allowing for an uncommon break, breakdown of party discipline in the UK in British politics uh, was not something that she could even think through because of the tremendous consequences that it would leave on to her party. Um, and Corbyn was against that as well for similar reasons, right? Because don't forget that at the time of the, the campaign before the referendum, a lot of um, MPs on both sides were Brexiters, right, and supported the referendum. And, a lot, and so the, there is a real kind of so, societal shift, like across society disagreement on this. Um, I mean, I can discuss this a bit more, but if you look at the demography as to who voted against or who voted for Brexit, you discover that it's actually across party lines. It has to do with um, level of education, age, and skin color. It's very simple. Like You look at minorities, they were against Brexit. You look at educated youth, they were against Brexit. You've got your answer. And urban rural, you know, urban, urbanites, against Brexit, rural, pro-Brexit. So it really cuts across these traditional party um, and ideological movements. And that's why you have this strong 
kind of tensions within both parties, and, and the fact that the British political system, in a way, is at stake. Um, and I think that you know May has tried; he's trying very, very hard to protect that party. Now, I'll just add one thing, and then I'll close this. One of the things that I discovered also, which I think is really fascinating, is that, and I'm you know I'm an academic, so I don't I'm not taking part here, but there is a lack of knowledge of how the EU Commission works on behalf of EU member states. The idea that you can negotiate a treaty with the EU elite. In other words, even Jean, you know, the president of the commission, is completely, um, uh, is, is a demonstration that they don't know EU process, that they have not worked within the European institutions. People who do research on the EU have, have done research on the EU since. Um, um, 1988, and I started by doing about 250 interviews in the EU Commission to, to write my PhD. And so, when you when you actually understand, when you are trained that way, you actually know how the EU works. No wonder Barnier had a clear mandate, and nobody nobody ever criticized the mandate because the mandate was set up, and he is. The, you know, he's the flagship for all the member states. Um, and that's really important. It's not going to Brussels. So when they go to Brussels, every time they go to Brussels, I'm kind of laughing because they think they're going to have high level meetings with ministers. But no one commissioner will ever bypass Barnier. Right? Because it's not in their mandate. They're, it's not in their mandate, so it's not their job to do this, even though they have ministerial status at the EU level for the policies that they manage and their budget and so on and so forth. They would never go, and even though they have passed elected official, like all of the, all of the current commissioners across the EU are all former ministers, prime ministers of member states, in member states. They all have elect, they all are, are elected official, all of them, including Juncker. Right? But none of them would ever deal with outside of their portfolio. And I think the, in the UK, the elite has not to this day understood this. It's not going to happen. You can have a meeting with Juncker, that's fine. You can have lunch with him. You can even have a negotiation with Juncker. In the end, it's Barnier, who is actually the key official in all of this, and his staff. Now, another thing I just, for, you know, I, just a, a very short thing is the the whole issue, um, um, no, I, th I think I'll pass with this and then we can I'll take some. Do you think that Brexit will never happen? Would you, <coughs> you want to comment on that as well, on the question? Will, will it ever happen? It's happening in two weeks' time. It's happening. It's happening. There's a, you know, people yeah, keep it, saying, is it going to happen? Is it going to be put off? It, it's later. happening. That's the reality. Um, even though the, but, um, uh, it, it's not my brief here, but if you'll let me just one. <laughs> yeah, 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 no, please. Uh, uh, you know, um, Theresa May, so they say, before she came to power and Cameron pushed this thing through. And why did Cameron push it through? Someone said it. Because no one ever believed it was going to be the vote in that way. I mean, there's no question about it whatsoever. Um, and um, she then came through as Prime Minister on the back of this. Um, it's commonly accepted that she was not a pro Brexit. She may not have been the most vocal Remainer, but she's not a pro Brexit. A person gets the one opportunity in their lifetime to become prime minister. They take it when it comes. They take it when it comes along, and uh, she hasn't been a tr tremendously successful in negotiating the Brexit. She probably thought she would be more successful. She holds to the principle that there was a people's vote, and we have to, you know, right. hold to it because this is what democracy is about. There are increasing voices for a second referendum, and even now the Labour Party has said that it would back it if it came on the table. I'm not sure the EU, well, you know, again, as though the EU aren't a player in this, you know, we're going to have a second referendum, um, you know, uh, and while, when they've been driving it, with all due respect, the EU crazy for the past uh, two or three years and what they believe should be the terms of their exit. Um, I, 
you know, on the one hand, I disagree with Theresa May's post. On the other hand, I feel very sorry for her. I think she was a very capable Home Secretary. And, um, you know, she's attacked from both sides in bringing it through. She said very clearly she's not going to stand for election again because she... And I personally think that the only reason that she hasn't been, in a sense, deposed by her own party by now is because who would want to take on a British government at the moment before the Brexit date has passed? Who would want to? It's like... Uh, you know, it's like being a kamikaze uh, pilot to do such a thing. I think one of the things that the Conservative Party can hold themselves uh, grateful for is that, you know, the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn, is himself such a divisive figure. I think had there been a more centrist Labour Party leader at the moment, it's very possible there would have been an election of the Conservative Party. I mean, it's a possibility. It's one of the ifs. But he, of course, is a very divisive uh, personality. His own party is breaking up in front of him but the most important thing Emmanuel said and that is I don't remember as someone growing up in Britain being very interested in British politics and following it as closely as I follow Israeli politics I don't remember an issue being so divided across both parties it's not that the Conservatives are Brexit and Labour remain you have a huge a significant amount of members of Parliament in both parties who are for and against um, and that is something very quite unique in 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 British politics as such. Just one observation. Um, ever since we have this Brexit vote, we have been organizing talks here, and, and, and the British Embassy always made sure that there would be somebody here to you know, uh, speak for their position. But uh, this time, nobody is here. So apparently, <laughs> if, if, if this is a sign, uh, it's, uh, they have given up on defending their position. May I yeah, please. Now, do you uh, expect that if supposing this happens and ever happens a possibility that the game finally goes off, would they be starting off a Pandora's box? Mm -hmm. Other countries would also be starting it off? And I. And how soon? Yes. So, the view of the Europeans on this, and I'm not talking about Britain, the view of the Europeans on this is that. Brexit has been successful as a referendum because of interference. Because of? Interference in the election from outside powers. Mm. Even, even President Emmanuel Macron from France wrote about this very recently in the media. Tusk said it also, the president of the EU. Okay, so it's very important to understand that, you know, all of the issues around uh, using Facebook, using or whatever platform, media platform to influence elections, uh, today is a major risk across the world. It's not just European. And people see in, indeed a rise of nationalism, but for instance, the election of the nationalist right in Italy, for instance, is again a case of interference in the elections. And uh, it's quite interesting to see that the current, the current party, the current uh, government, is actually now losing so much support that it's a new Italian crisis, right? So that's the, that's the, the first answer. So it is possible that in the next European election that are coming in the spring, such interference will come. But a lot of European leaders are very well of, aware of this. And in the case of, for instance, the French election, which were between, have happened exactly halfway between the Brexit referendum and today, um, France had put in place all that was necessary to prevent this from, um, from happening. So there is a risk. Um, but there is a lesson in the Brexit, which is what I've presented you, like just a fraction, right? The lesson, the lesson of the Brexit is, I think, quite clear is that countries, and, fr and I'm talking from the perspective of a border scholar, right? I'm just looking at border policies here. So custom policies, immigration policies, the cross of the boundary line, the cost of the military, the cost of the security, the impact on trade, the impact on wealth, the impact on well-being of borderlanders, people who live in border regions, and so on and so forth. What I find really, really fascinating in the Brexit is that a border costs a lot of money. It costs so much money that it's mind-boggling. And states assume that it's OK to pay all of this. But you know what? If people are aware of the cost of a border, 
maybe they don't want it anymore because they'd rather have that money in education and social policies. Like in Canada, you know, in Canada, the cost of the border is something that we have to discuss on a regular basis. And after 9-11, I'll just talk about this for a few minutes, I bring it home, so that we don't just talk about the UK also. But in Canada, after 9-11, there was the whole issue of security, Trump, trade, or trade, Trump, security. Canada, general position was that trade was the top priority with the United States. For the US, it was security. Where was the compromise? Well, you see the compromise today. A fairly transparent border for traders, a fairly hard border for mobility. But with policies that took a number of years and agreements that took a number of years to basically implement that facilitation, right? So you strengthen the border gates across the two countries, but at the same time, you allow people and traders to register so that they pass it really easily. So, you know, you're a trader and you track things across the border, right? Post 9-11, sometime people were waiting 24 hours. The trucks were, the cost for the auto industry was like mind boggling, right? So it was millions of dollars per day that was lost by these industries. Today, the average to cross the border for a registered trader is 48 or 52 seconds depending. Why? Because they have electronic responders on the truck and they, trans they transfer the information using Bluetooth. So all of the clearance, all of the paper, everything goes through. Obviously, they still have border gates, but you, you go through the border gate slowly and the readers the, you know, can see what's in the truck, you can assess what's in the truck, and it's the same with Nexus. When you have your Nexus card as an indi individual person, it's the same. They can read your car when you cross, but you don't stop. You basically are there for, what, 12 seconds, 15 seconds, up and off you go. So this, this, this is kind of, in a way, in my mind, what could be the, the, the backstop position. But it took, on the Canadian side, a few hundred million of investments. And on the US side, it was also a major investment. But staffing went up five times on the US side. Because the whole issue pre-9-11 was that the US side had always a deficit in staffing. Most of the staffing was done on the US-Mexico border, where you have 22,000 people on an ongoing basis, right? And it's, but North, on the north part of the border, they had like under 1,000 people, whereas Canada had 2,500. So now it's about the same level with coordination plus the electronic help. But it took a number of years. Hence, the backstop is a, a temporary position, but it will be for Northern Ireland, but it will be difficulty. All of this has a huge cost. Closer, but, but just I know I, I, as a European, I would like to make uh, one remark regarding your question is, is that uh, that is also a result of the Brexit uh, process and of the enormous costs, but not only that, that um, uh, the, the support for the European Union at the moment is actually higher than it has been for, for a very long time. And I think that also shows that Brexit is also a very specific British <coughs> issue that has always been there. One very short yeah. Yes, point. yes, please. Uh, yes, you're right that these are enormous amounts of money, but they're actually utterly insignificant amounts of money compared to the size of the British economy. They will actually lose far more than that in growth that they will never get as a result of not being in the European Union, particularly on the services trade. So the figures you're talking about, they sound like small amounts of money. They are nothing compared to what the UK will actually lose. And Europe actually recognises this, and it's not been just a British project. The major opposition party in France was in favour of the French president. It was until Brexit succeeded. The number one change in their political position from the last election is they now are definitely in favour of staying in the EU, whereas they used to be in favour of leaving the EU. All the parties in Europe that used to be anti-EU parties are, oh, no, 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 what made you think? that we were anti-EU. We're not as stupid as the British. <laughs> <laughs> That's the major effect it's had. People are waiting in queue.
So that's a really good point, but for me that's kind of the... So, so it's, it's talking about re the re-implementation of orders and saying it's 100 billion pounds. It's not so much, I agree with you. But you're right, the consequence is what happens in terms of economic growth afterwards, right? Minus one and a half to minus four percent over a period of five to eight years, right? That's basically it. in growth. Any last words from David or from Joita? I'm just drawing that. I mean, when you think of, uh, despite everything that's going on in Israel Palestine, um, you know, that the overall economic and quality of life levels, at least within Israel, are extremely high. Tourism, despite everything, is high. You think of what the potential long-term economic growth of conflict resolution in Israel Palestine is. It's just, it's just astounding. I mean, then, it, yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going just to leave you with a border caricature. <laughs> Juita, anything? <laughs> okay, I, I, I actually do not even try to sum up the discussion here. If, uh, I think it leaves us with a lot of food for thought about borders and how, uh, how fruitful it is actually to look at many of the problems that we are facing at the moment globally under, uh, under this lens of, of, of border conflicts. Um, I thank, thank you all of you uh, who have been here on the, on, on the dice and uh, also for you for coming and uh, uh, having a very interesting discussion here. Uh, if you'd like to join us, there's uh, tea and samosas outside. Um, thank you very much and uh, do come again. It was very interesting. <laughs>